Let's now consider the syntax of a kernel definition. Defining a kernel is very similar to defining a normal C function. The main difference is the global keyword preceding the void return type. Note that there are two underscores before and after the word global. This global keyword is called the kernel's declaration specifier. The global declaration specifier is a directive that tells the compiler that this function is supposed to be called from the host but ran on the device. Kernels that are called from the host never return a value, so the return type must be set to void. Any results that the kernel computes are stored in the device's memory. In order to manipulate data, we have to use the pass by reference technique. To perform pass by reference, we pass in a pointer argument that points to the memory address of the variable stored in the device's memory. So when a kernel is launched, the operations inside the kernel's body are performed for every thread that executes this kernel. In this example, every thread will simply copy the zeroth element of the array d sub in into the zeroth element of the array d sub out. Clearly, this is not a very useful kernel. For us to index into a different element, of an array for each instance of a thread, we need a method of distinguishing the threads from one another. This is achieved through determining each thread's index. In practice, we always want to launch a kernel as a large number of threads. So the threads need a way of keeping track of their position within their corresponding block. Threads are aware of their position within a block by using CUDA's intrinsic thread IDX. Thread IDX has a corresponding X, Y, and Z component, which can be accessed using the dot notation dot X, dot Y, and dot Z. In this example on the screen, we're going to launch a kernel as a grid with a single block. Within that block, there are N threads in the X dimension. So for this example, the thread IDX values corresponding to this block span the range from thread IDX dot X equals zero to thread IDX dot X equals N minus one. Let's now take a look at an example that will demonstrate how to use this thread IDX intrinsic. In this example, we're going to convert a for loop into a set of parallel threads. Let's first take a look at the for loop in normal C code that would run on the CPU. We begin the program in the main function just as normal. We then declare a length in array and initialize the array with data. Next, we pass into a function the array and its length in. Now inside the body of the function, we simply increment the value of each element in the array by one which is achieved with a for loop running from 0 to n minus 1. Since all iterations through this for loop are independent of each other, this problem can be easily decomposed into a parallel problem using n parallel CUDA threads. To perform this same operation using n parallel threads in a CUDA kernel, we begin the main function as in the CPU program declaring and initializing an array of length n. We'll call this array h sub a because its data will live on the host. Next, we allocate device memory of the same size as the host's array. Then we copy the data from the array in host memory into the device's memory. Next, we set up the configuration parameters of the grid in the block dimension. In this example, we're going to execute a grid with one block, and inside that block there's going to be n threads. Next, we launch the kernel and pass in as arguments the array d sub a and its length n. Now in the body of the kernel, we first grab the index of the specific thread being executed from the thread idx.x intrinsic, 
and we store that value in the variable i. Then we're going to replace the for loop with a single increment operation where each thread is going to perform an increment on a different element of the array. As a safety precaution, we will perform the increment operation inside an if statement that is bounded by the length of the array. This if statement ensures that we don't step off the end of the array. In this example, since we're launching the kernel with only n threads inside a single block, we actually already know that we will not access any elements beyond the end of the array. However, it's good practice to implement this if statement because in a real CUDA program, we'll usually execute more threads than there are elements of a specific array. The following code is not actually shown in order to display the code on a single screen, but after the kernel launch, we would of course copy the results back into the host's memory from the device memory using CUDA mem copy, and then we would free any memory allocated. To finish up this lecture, let's take a look at a more practical yet still very simple example. Let's say that we want to add two length in floating point vectors. Since the addition of vectors is a simple element wise operation, each of these additions is independent of all other additions. So vector addition can be achieved by adding each corresponding element of the two arrays together in a separate thread. Implementation of a kernel that will perform this vector addition will be left as a programming exercise.